Hello, welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and this episode is all about the NATO Rapid Response Force. This unit is designed to be the West's way of responding to any microaggressions by countries like Russia or China. So they're able to deploy anywhere in the world at the drop of a hat. On the other hand, some analysts think this unit is outdated, under-equipped, and not ready to tackle anything other than small security threats. But this story actually tracks the US and NATO's change in strategy from the beginning of the Cold War all the way to today. With the benefit of hindsight, we're able to see where NATO made some mistakes, where they misjudged, the type of response force that they would need, and where they got it right. You know, growing up, you probably had banned posters on your wall. Meanwhile, I had posters of the NATO Rapid Response Force on mine. All of the 30 different countries that make up the military alliance of NATO usually operate very independently from one another, with a minimum amount of coordination happening between international units. Everyone stays in their own lane for the most part, except when it comes to the Rapid Response Force. They're like the all star baseball team, but for the military. So dreamy. What I mean by that is each country in the alliance sends their best soldiers to rotate in and out of this unit. When the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was originally created in the aftermath of World War II in 1949, the group originally had no multinational quick response force. So why do you need to create the NATO response force then? And what's all this I hear about it being plagued with problem after problem from the beginning to the point where some analysts think that it should be disbanded altogether? How does the Alliance decide when to use the response force and when to just look the other way? Is it completely arbitrary? Did you know that the NRF wasn't used during Russia's first invasion of Ukraine in 2014? Major missed opportunity. You blew it, NRF. So stick around to the end of the video where we're gonna cover the response to Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine in 2022. And if you enjoyed this video, please remember to fire off around into your like and subscribe button. Let's move out, Hua. Hey, Spare Parts Army. So before we get into what's wrong with the NATO Response Force, I wanna tell you about a huge change that I just made in my life last month that I'm very excited about. It's gonna have a huge impact for the channel and the quality of the work. And this story is sponsored by Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Raycons are priced just right. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. Last month, I moved out of New York City to New Jersey so I could finally have a dedicated studio space to make these videos. The studio is definitely still a work in progress, but it's coming together. The best thing about being in the suburbs now is I have the ability to jog through these nature trails. The Raycon earbuds allow me to listen to my favorite podcasts and music to help distract me from how entirely out of shape I am. They come in a variety of different modular optimized gel tips for the perfect fit, no matter how oddly shaped your ears might be. They don't budge even when you awkwardly fall, you're still good to go. So when I read through these like 100 page documents, one of my favorite things to do to pass the time is I listen to music on these Raycon earbuds. I just pop them in when I have some all night editing to do. I can now see why they have over 48,000 five-star reviews. Being out of the city, now I actually have to drive a car, which can be pretty boring sometimes. Raycon earbuds aren't gonna die on me. They have eight hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash task and purpose. Get 15% off your Raycon purchase. In 2002, at the NATO Prague Summit, which is like the summer camp for military alliances, they first decided to launch a new unit called the NATO Response Force. I ask you about this rapid, what they call a rapid reaction yes. force. Yes. Uh, it would go uh, a force of 5,000 to 20,000 troops that could be sent into battle within a month. In, in 1994, we had a combined joint task force that can be formed to receive troops in 14 days. So this to me is with the headquarters, now the capability that go with it. Uh, this is not a Cold War formation. There you have it, straight from the former NATO Allied Supreme Commander. This is not your grandfather's NATO. It fills what's called a capability gap. So that gap, that vacuum between the UN peacekeeping forces and the slow moving, cumbersome big armies like the US military, that's where this new NRF would sit. Tr this was truly a revolutionary time for NATO. You gotta remember, this is the same summit where they're thinking of adding all these new countries. This could be seen by some people as early NATO expansion. So it takes a lot of time to deploy units. The initial goal was to create a real life force with assigned combat units, not merely a disorganized troop list that had been pulled together from different 
countries on an ad hoc basis like it was before. No, the new NRF, the NATO Response Force, is a cohesive group of different elements from different countries. When this force is used, it has the added benefit of knowing that many of the member states will have some skin in the game. It's kind of shocking they didn't have something like this prior. There are very high standards, high readiness levels for these troops. The NRF is the top quality prepared, so my hands in my pockets, boots on blouse look wouldn't qualify. To be chosen for this elite unit, you need to take part in six month exercise programs, and then it's designed around the standardization of international military tactics, so you have to learn all about that. The pre-training period is around a year long. All of this training is prep work so that they're able to deploy quickly anywhere in the world. The recon teams make up phase one of the deployment for this unit, which can last anywhere between one and five days. That's almost as fast as Amazon Prime speeds there. Oh God, now I'm waiting for an Amazon Prime inevitably they're gonna come out with a mercenary army option. So five days might sound like a long time, but the NRF is combined operations units. They're not just light airborne teams. The NRF has tanks, jets, naval ships, and bearded special forces units with black bars over their eyes. Deployment of the entire HQ joint force and immediate reaction forces takes up to 30 days long. Again, that might sound like a long time, but these are heavily armed troops that need to be moved into position slowly. It takes a minute to set up bases and infrastructure to provide for those units. Any faster than 30 days, and you will have overshot your logistics unit. The NRF is supposedly made up of 40,000 soldiers, according to many sources that you'll read. But that's not really the full story, because when you dig a little deeper, it turns out that that 40K number is actually only referring to the number of personnel that it could potentially end up with. All the member states agreed 40,000 is the top amount of troops that the NRF can have. In reality, the number is much lower at around 12,000 soldiers. And then even lower when you consider the real core of the NRF is about 3,500 soldiers, but we'll get into that later. In an interesting article written by John R. Denis titled Disband the NATO Response Force, he outlines some of the problems that this unit faces. You see, apparently the NRF has been plagued with problems since its creation when it was declared fully operational in 2006. To me, it doesn't mean we should necessarily give up and toss this thing out, but there are some valid concerns here that need to be addressed. From the beginning, it faced shortages in its fighter jets and helicopter units. The entire team didn't have reliable intelligence or logistics units. Not everyone was pitching in their fair share of resources in the NATO countries. Sure, you could blame part of this on the fact that the alliance was stretched thin fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, but that doesn't account for all of these issues here. You see, the lack of units led to the entire thing being reorganized in 2009. So it went from having 25,000 troops to cutting that number in half. So after this point, they had about 13,000 soldiers and it was called the Multinational Immediate Response Force. It now had a different mission set with more specific missions, a more narrow mission objective list. So before it was this broad, general, all encompassing concept, but personally, I don't see that as a bad thing. Sometimes you have to redefine and retool concepts, especially in the early stages. And that's exactly what NATO was actually planning to do. They had written about it prior. Everything needs to change and evolve. For instance, when I first started making YouTube videos, this was exclusively a military dog and military makeup channel. And now it's evolved into something different. And in the future, it'll probably be a military Minecraft channel. So look forward to that. Some of the main tasks of the NATO response force include crisis management, which can mean responding to any crisis like chaos during elections. They'll be some of the first on the scene in the event of a dreaded World War III. The NRF also handles peacekeeping missions that the UN isn't right for. They respond to natural disaster relief and they're tasked with protecting critical infrastructure, so like power plants. Immediate defense of alliance members in the event then an Article 5 clause comes into effect. That means if one of the NATO countries gets attacked, then the NRF is gonna be the first to respond. So has this unit ever been deployed before? Yes. The first time they were used was in 2004 during the Afghan election. They were used during the Athen Olympic Games and during disaster relief in Pakistan in 2005. The funny part, the NRF was not used during Russia's first invasion of Crimea in 2014, and that it would have been a perfect opportunity for a large scale deployment. It would have been justified use of force, yet, they were nowhere to be seen. Why would they balk at the one real justified chance to deploy even to a nearby NATO country? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, the NRF wasn't designed to move quickly enough. It was too large and clunky to get a consensus and respond in time. Back then, everyone wanted to pay as little attention as possible 
to that conflict. They, of course, they wanted to look for ways around it, hoping that they wouldn't have to directly confront Russia. At the time, in 2014, everyone was still holding out hope that Russia was going to be our besties. I think the NRF has a bit of a groupthink decision by committee problem. All right, everyone's got their coffee and pastries, great. Let's pool our opinions and then put our fingers to the wind and uh, take a vote and come up with the least risky and most useless decision possible, huh? When you have so many different countries involved, they all need to sign off and agree to how this unit's gonna be used and where they're gonna send the forces. At the end of the day, the overall command of the NRF is in the hands of the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Getting a consensus is difficult unless it's for hurricane relief, which no one can easily say no to. So did they learn anything from this incident though? Kind of yes and no. After the 2014 Ukraine invasion by Russia and the annexation of Crimea, this led to NATO rethinking their whole force and adding the spearhead force called the Joint Task Force Selection Unit. This is the elite special forces, high speed, low drag types who are small and able to move quickly. Surely now Russia would be deterred from acting on it in class ever again. Checkmate. This response from NATO to form four multinational battle groups of roughly a battalion size, so 800 to 1,000 troops. Now you're not gonna mix different countries because there's a problem speaking different languages. So you're always gonna have, say, a battalion or a brigade from France and a brigade from Canada. The JTF is mostly led by the United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, and the United States. They were actually forward deployed on a rotational basis to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. In 2015, they ran a series of trials and exercises to evaluate and refine this concept and how it would be implemented. Before we get into the NRF's response to what happened in Ukraine in 2022, we need to understand the history of how valuable the NATO Rapid Response Force is and what they're up against in terms of their adversaries. Russia has been increasing their militarization and mobilization over the past 10 years. The Russian military was pretty stagnant from 1991 to 2010. In 2009, Russia changed their entire national security strategy. On May 13th, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, who was basically a puppet controlled by Putin, he went ahead and wrote out and created what was called the National Security Strategy of Russia. And this went on through the year 2020. This thing has since provided the basis and rationale for Russia's military doctrine and foreign policy. Isn't it fascinating how countries put into writing exactly what they say they're gonna do. And then when we have this plan in front of us, we still don't see this coming. It basically states that Russia wants to become the world's leading political and economic power. Now that's all well and good. I, I commend that effort, that goal, but they believed that NATO was an obsolete security organization and that it should be replaced by a new body, mainly them. It states that NATO's expansion to countries sharing borders with Russia and NATO's scope of missions are deemed unacceptable by Russia. They flat out say that an increase in global competition for resources could lead to military conflict, including near the border of Russia and its allies. This is what the strategy document warns about. Now it seems obvious in hindsight that this was all headed to war and that there was escalation happening in Europe. Ben Hodges, the former commander of the US Army in Europe, and he's currently the Pershing Chair in the Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis. He was quoted as saying some criticism of NATO's current response posture. He said, quote, we need to recalculate the entire readiness posture of our military forces because collectively NATO forces are not ready. Germany has three divisions, but they're not ready to fight. The British army today is way too small. NATO exercises are far too scripted in advance and they put too much emphasis on distinguished visitor day rather than adopting the necessary rigor where you train to failure and then learn from the experience. And he's very right because I don't think it was so much NATO that needed to train on that. It was Russia that needed to train on all that. But it's true that NATO also also needs to train on that. On February 25th, 2022, the day after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, NATO all got together and said, hey, what should we do about all this nonsense going on here? Secretary General Jens Stoltzberg said that the NATO leadership agreed to deploy the NRF. We saw that the NATO response force was activated in a way that it had never been used prior to then. Up until now, it had all been low level security missions. This time it was called on to guard Alliance territory. That doesn't mean that it was called on to guard Ukraine. No, it was stationed to protect actual NATO countries. Since the Alliance needs to come to a consensus on how many troops they're sending, they were adjusting the amounts of soldiers and tailoring it to the mission. The NRF would be sent to the Alliance Eastern flank and it would be made up of mainly French troops whose turn it was to be rotated into that position. Currently, it's mostly made up of about 3,500 French and German brigades. General Todd Walters, who's the current head of the US European Command and is the NATO Supreme Allied Commander, said this quote, this is a historic moment and the very 
very first time that the Alliance has employed these high readiness forces in a deterrence and defensive role. Before the invasion even happened on February 11th, 2022, NATO response included 4,700 troops from the 82nd Airborne, which were sent to Poland, and a cavalry striker unit, which was sent to Romania. One thing I could see happening is that the NRF might be replaced by a rapid autonomous drone force. What do you all think? Did I miss something in my analysis or do you agree? Let me know in the comments section. Thank you for watching Task and Purpose. I'm Chris Cappy. Follow me on Instagram and check out this playlist that covers a lot of NATO weapons right here if you want to learn more.